Hi everybody, thanks for coming back and listening to me again talk about my passion for the Battle of Britain and in particular I think that what's so important is the forgotten heroes. Now how, how can you quantify that in something like the Battle of Britain because we have all kinds of people involved don't we? We've not just got fighter pilots or fighter aircrew, um, we have Bomber Command, Coastal Command, there were people from Training Command who gave their lives in the defence of this country. Then there's all the support staff and all of the emergency services, the Observer Corps. The list is absolutely endless. Uh, and when we get into talking about the bombing of London, um, as we get further along with Volume 5 of the 8 volume official series, the Million Word Project, um, you'll see there. It's certainly the uh, ambulance drivers uh, and, of course, the fire brigade did an absolutely fantastic job. And it's entirely right now that down at the National Memorial to the Few, there's a new appeal running, uh, Blades of Glory, which uh, is to put the names of some of those people on tiles around the Airmen Memorial so that they do get recognised in some way. And of course, the few are recognised there. That's what the memorial exists for. And there's the Christopher Foxley Norris Memorial Wall, which has recorded on it all of the names of the few, or at least all of those that are known. Because there are some more uh, names to go on there next year, including Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, or Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, the ultimately was, uh, following my discovery that he was a legitimate Class Polder, there's a video on the channel uh, about that. It's a fascinating story. So, um, yeah, they're going to be recognised. But my interest has always been amongst those people who, who were unsung, really. Now, growing up in the 1960s, you know, I was acutely aware through war films and through various books that the famous pilots, the Douglas Barders, the Johnny Johnsons, the Bob Stanford Tucks, the Aldeas, they'd either written their own uh, autobiographies, their own memoirs, or other people have. Paul Brickhill, for example, a Spitfire pilot, former prisoner of war and journalist who uh, brought us Reach for the Sky, the somewhat romanticised view of Barda's story. Uh, but in addition, uh, the Dam Busters and uh, The Great Escape, uh, some fantastic stuff, really, for, for a schoolboy in the 60s. Um, but there are countless, countless other people who had no platform to tell their story. Uh, and that really resonated with me. And that was one of the reasons why I started my research in the first place, well over 40 years ago. Because I, I wanted, as a, a young person with no resources, really, or training at the time, to reach out to those people and try and record those memories, those stories, and provide them a platform uh, to, to, to share them. It's so important that, that they are recorded, I think. And that sort of work was also underpinned by the stories of casualties and those who didn't survive, those who don't have a voice, and who, therefore, people who knew them, their family, their friends, the, the, the records, the, the letters, the diaries, whatever they may have left behind, speak for them, which is a great thing. Uh, but there are many, many forgotten heroes, many, uh, all stories that need to be told. And some are very short stories. They live very short and violently ended lives. Uh, others live longer. Others flew all through the war and therefore have extensive stories to tell. And one such person is somebody, I'll bet the majority of people watching this video, unless they've read my book, Forgotten Heroes uh, of the Battle of Britain, which was published by Pen and Sword uh, in 2022. I think it was my 50th book, actually, this one. So um, the idea of this book was to concentrate on some of the stories that had come my way over the years of and they are all pilots. I mean, it, it wasn't a book that went, right, I'm going to do Forgotten Heroes, the Battle of Britain, therefore I'm going to go and seek out 
ambulance drivers, firemen, things like that. It didn't work like that. It was just that I had these stories that in in in, in isolation, each one is not enough for a book in its own right. But if you put them together, which I've done before, through Perils of the Stars about casualties back in 93, a few of the many about survivors in 95, uh, you've got a book. And each chapter tells a different story of a different person. And, and this is why uh, uh, I want to talk about Wing Commander Eric Hugh Tommy Thomas. What a guy. Uh, absolutely unbelievable. The, the, this, per, the, this man, uh, his, his operating experience is immense. Um, and, and yet, he's certainly not one of those people who immediately springs to mind if, if, if you think of the few and Battle of Britain parties. But let's just have a look at his story. So, so he's born in Tunbridge Wells, 10th of October, 1917. His father was a bit of a character. He'd gone away from school to fight in the Boer War, but then got sent home because he was uh, not old enough. Uh, but later um, saw action in the First World War. So after a private education, and that's important in those days, because um, you would not have got a commission in the Royal Air Force or any of the services without a school certificate A, a letter signed by an officer of equivalent of Colonel, prior membership of the Officer Training Corps, and um, attendance at a public school, private school. So that's crucially important. You've got all those things. You've got the key to a commission. And in 1936, the Royal Air Force, which had prior to, between the wars, had been wound down, is now expanding. We're into the 1936 expansion scheme, where it's clear that war with Germany is very likely. Indeed, some may have thought inevitable even then. So at that time, Eric Thomas takes a short service commission in the Royal Air Force. And this was one of the things uh, that Trenchard, the father of the Royal Air Force, had put in place to increase the, the manpower. So, so the idea is prior, prior to that, the RAF was a small professional service and its officers were, were trained at Cranwell, which in fact was an extension of the public school system. It was a fee-paying setup. But the, but, and the idea was you, you, were, you had what was called a permanent commission so that's, that's what you did for the rest of your working life. You were an officer in the Royal Air Force. Uh, but the short service commission, what this meant was people, you know, they were aware then that pilots and air crew, they need to be uh, young and fit. So it was really aimed at adventurous, young, aviation-minded men, not women, just men, who um, wanted to fly with the Royal Air Force. Uh, and that they signed up to do for four years after which they will go on to the reserve and return to their civilian occupations uh, uh, and be eligible for mobilization, called up to full-time service in the event of uh, there being a general emergency, which is to say a war. So Eric has got a short service commission, completes his uh, service flying training, and then goes to 19 Squadron at Duxford. 19 Squadron is a famous fighter squadron, great pedigree, uh, dating back to 1918 and the First World War, uh, and now the squadron is flying Gloucester Gauntlet biplane fighters. And this isn't so good because in 1935 the Messerschmitt 109 all metal monoplane fighter flew in Germany, and that became Germany's frontline fighter pretty quickly. Uh, and we're still messing about with biplanes. But uh, Eric goes to, or Tommy as he was called on the squadron. Let's call him Tommy. Tommy goes to uh, 19 Squadron there, flying gauntlets, and even takes his dogs flying, Nimbus 1 and Nimbus 2, his, uh, his pets. Uh, and it's a happy squadron, 19, commanded by uh, squadron leader uh, Henry Cousins. And of course, 4th of August, 1938, 19 Squadron really goes down in history when Geoffrey Quill, the uh, Supermarine test pilot, delivers to 19 Squadron the Royal Air Force's first Spitfire. And James Coward, flying officer in Australian, who was on the squadron, uh, recalled that Geoffrey, who I knew, absolutely lovely man, by the way, um, arrived 
on the final leg, inverted at a thousand feet, dropped down, lowered his undercarriage, um, inverted, and then just rolled over and landed. Perfect. What a pilot. Absolutely amazing. So, 15th of August, Pilot Officer Thomas flies a Spitfire for the first time. So, he is one of the Royal Air Force's first ever Spitfire pilots. Those those pilots on 19 Squadron in 1938, they were the first pilots to fly a Spitfire. And it's to Cousin's great credit that the squadron actually introduced the type to service by day and night uh, without suffering a single casualty. Now that's pretty remarkable because this is an advanced aeroplane, the Spitfire, compared to a Gauntlet, uh, which is possibly why Jeffrey arrived at Duxford inverted and popped up the undercarriage because it was such a new thing. Really, for a fighter, biplanes have got a fixed undercarriage uh, and lots of, you know, an open cockpit. And Spitfires and Hurricanes, have got, they've got the enclosed cockpit, uh, it, you know, advanced airplane. So, Tommy um, starts flying Spitfires and becomes an experienced Spitfire pilot. Gets passed off as uh, operational by, by day and night. But then, and, th and this is a bit paradoxical, really. April 1939, so this is before war's been declared, he then gets posted to, uh, to the advanced uh, training squadron at Cranwell. Now, this guy has just been flying the world's, or the RAF's anyway, Britain's most advanced fighter, the Spitfire, right? The iconic Spitfire, everybody wants to fly. So you then go to the advanced squadron to fly all Dax biplane. Now, I'm pretty sure he must have been wondering what on earth was advanced about that. But nonetheless, that's what he did. And he was there when uh, war broke out in uh, 3rd of September 1939. And he was still there uh, until the 19th of August 1940. So the Battle of Britain has started. Dunkirk has been and gone. That was over by the beginning of June 1940, the ignominious evacuation of Lord Gort's British Expeditionary Force from, from uh, the continent uh, and over the Dunkirk beaches. Of course, his not the former 19th Squadron had been in action for the first time against the ME-109. And he rejoins 19th Squadron, which is then at Falmere, which is the Duxford Satellite. Great little museum at, at Falmere, actually. Um, run by a couple of volunteer friends of mine. Super job if you're ever over there. See if they're open, pay them a visit. Very, very well done. Um, so, 19 squadrons at that time, they're up in 12 group. Most of the battle is going on over in London and the South East, the 11 group area. So it's a bit quieter for 19 squadron. They've also got problems. They've got the, the, the experimental Spitfire Mark 1B with the... Uh, 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 troublesome cannon that kept jamming because it was mounted the wrong way, long story, all for another day. Um, and, you know, there's not that much action to be had. Bit of convoy patrolling, bit of action there, bit of reconnaissance aircraft, things like that. Um, but only uh, five days later, Tommy is sent off to join 266 Squadron at Wittery. Now, this is another 12 group squadron. Now, whereas 19 is operational uh, and a frontline 12 group squadron 266 is rebuilding after uh, a spell in uh, 11 group so uh, tommy has yet to fly the spitfire operationally so he's gone to that squadron to get some more experience you can you can clearly see this uh, and then on the 10th of september 1940 by which time he's cocked up some more flying time some current flying time on the spitfire He's posted to Treble 2 Squadron, uh, commanded by Squadron Leader John Hill, at uh, Hornchurch in Essex, one of the sector stations in the Ring of Steel, if you like, uh, around London. And he's posted there on promotion to Flight Lieutenant to command a flight. So that's an advancement. And his first combat is at 14 15 hours over Sheerness on Battle of Britain Day on the 15th of September. 1940, when he shoots down with pilot officer Ronald Raz Berry of 603 Squadron, also at Hornchurch, uh, they hack down a Dawning 17. 
which crashes near Maidstone. And that's his first taste of combat. Uh, and from then on, it's relentless. The flying is relentless. The patrolling, the interceptions. And as we go into October 1940, we, we've got a really changed situation. I, we should have a podcast um, or a video, I think, about, about that about the ME109, because that was really what was driving it. Very high altitude, 30, 31,000 feet, and uh, it meant that fighter command had to mount standing patrols to meet these uh, raiders as they came in very fast. Uh, and this is really exhausting flying, physically uh, exhausting. Uh, and Tommy is there leading um, a flight, uh, leading the squadron actually very often. Uh, and they're operating in pairs with with 603 squadron and so on, uh, and it's, it's, it's physical stuff. 9th of October, he shoots down Feldwebel Schweizer of uh, uh, 7 Staffel JG24, near, uh, who's, who's captured actually near, near Hawking. Then, 29th of October, so this is just before the official end of the, of the Battle of Britain, so far as the Air Ministry's concern, which was the 31st of October 1940, there's a, a low and fast raid comes in on North Wheel. And uh, I've just written this up actually in volume seven of the Battle Brit Memorial Trust Official History, which is this massive project. And uh, 249 and 257 squadrons, hurricanes, are actually in the process of taking off when the bombs uh, are dropped by uh, 109 fighter bombs. And then there's all kinds of combat that goes on. And um, Flight Lieutenant Thomas has a hand uh, with Sergeant John Burgess um, from Treble 2 Squadron in shooting down uh, a rare bird, Oberleutnant Heinz Hintzer, oh, sorry, Otto Hintzer, who was Staffel Capitan of uh, uh, the third Staffel of her Pro Brunch Group of 210, which was a precision bombing unit, 109 pilot. Failed out capture. Now he's a good prize, very experienced guy. So that was down to Thomas. And one thing I would say, having looked at his combats and looked, you know, at, at the whole thing, a lot of pilots, you know, the ones that you're going to have trouble um, matching up their claims, combat claims, to actual kill. And the law of averages with some of them uh, alone just says that, well, that's maybe for another day. But Tommy Thomas's claims do match up. And more often than not, that there, there is a wreck on the ground. And there's no arguing with that, is there? So that's, that's another reason I admire uh, Tommy Thomas so much, because he is a genuine fighter pilot. He is a, a good fighter pilot. He's a good shot. And uh, um, there's no dispute in his claim. So... There we are. Now, um, 11th of November 1940, uh, Treble 2 Squadron is rested and sent up to Coltishall in 12 Group to refit and rebuild. And while they're up there, there's still operational flying to do, uh, which is uh, interceptions of nuisance raiders, reconnaissance aircraft, uh, and also to provide Kipper patrols, as Tommy's written in his logbook, which is convoy protection patrols. Uh, and on one of these, you know, there's more action. He, he, he engages a, a German bomber. Then, um, 27th of April 1941, the squadron goes down to Duxford and joins in an operation over France with the 12 Group Wing, 12 Group Duxford Wing. And by this time, there's a change in the top at Fighter Command. Um, Charlotte Douglas has taken Dowling's job as Commander in Chief. And uh, Lee Mallory, formerly commanding 12 Group, has taken over 11 from Keith Park. And they've gone on the front foot, to use a cricket term. They have gone on the offensive using big formations. There are three squadrons of Spitfires at every sector station now, which are called Wings. And the Spitfire is now in the process of completely replacing the Hurricane as the frontline day fighter. So... This is what's happening, and these these are these offensive. It's called the non-stop offensive. So he's involved in these very very early on, uh, but 
18th of May 1941, there's a tragedy uh, for the Thomas family because um, Tommy's brother, Flying Officer Bruce Tommy, who's an instructor on ferry battles um, with uh, 12 Service Flying Training School at Grantham, is up on a night flying exercise with a student and they're shot down by a German night fighter, by a German night intruder. Uh, and the Germans have been doing this during the Battle of Britain, actually. They've been stalking bombers back across the North Sea to their bases in Lincolnshire and Yorkshire and shooting them down. So, uh, so that was that, that was sad for the family that um, that Bruce is killed quite early on, really. But nineteenth uh, of June, nineteen forty-one, Tommy is then posted to ninety-one Squadron at Hawkinge, and ninety-one was started off life, life as four-two-one flight, which was formed out of a flight of six of sixty-six Squadron at Gravesend, and they were used as high-altitude spotters to report on the movements of German bomber form or German formations and, um, uh, and the composition of them because radar at the time was outward looking uh, and it was unable to track a formation once it's crossed the coast. We've got the observer core, but what happens if they're above 10 tenths cloud? Visual's not gonna happen from the ground, is it? Uh, and or equally, RDF could not, that's radio direction finally, RDF could not identify individual aircraft types within a formation. So the controllers now, you know, this time they need to know whether these formations have got fighter bombers amongst them. Uh, so that's what 91 Squadron was originally doing. So he goes down there, but he's not there for long. He's only there for about a week. And then he's posted uh, on promotion to Squadron Leader back to Hornchurch to Command 611 Squadron. And from then on, it is relentless. These bomber escort sorties, uh, offensive fighter sweeps, uh, all kinds going on over northwest France. Absolutely unbelievable. And uh, I'll just, I mean, his logbook is really detailed. And uh, I'll just read this to you, which is um, from his logbook, out of the book. And um, so this is, this is an operation on the 21st of October. And he says, a second operation that day actually, and he says, uh, lead squadron left English coast at Dungeness and found fairly thick haze up to 3,000 feet in the channel. Contacted rescue boats and escorted them to four to five miles off the 2K and then four miles off the loin. We were in this area for an hour at 2,000 to 3,000 feet, with shore guns firing at us occasionally. Eventually, the inevitable happened, and we were jumped by six ME109s and a few Focke-Wulf 190s. Charlie section got it in the neck. Pilot Officer Smith got shot down by a 109E and went downstream in glycol and hit the sea vertically. With hell of a splash just behind the rescue launches. All they could find was two oxygen bottles, actually it's probably compressed air bottles actually, uh, a pair of which cylinders, uh, uh, oh no, uh, and pilot officer Teddy Reeves got hit and called up to say so and he has not returned to base. It was not being shot down, it was murder of two damn good officers, the squadron's worst day, three, day, three pilots missing for no hun. Now th this is another thing, see th this, this uh, uh, non-stop offensive as it was called, uh, we lost so many experienced pilots, uh, and we know now uh, that the Germans were, were actually winning. Uh, the ratio was had swung in their favour because they've got all kinds of advantages. They've always got height advantages. They've always got they, they play to the strengths of their aircraft, the technical strengths of the aircraft. They've also now, as we've just heard, got the Focke Wulf 190, which outclassed the Spitfire Mark II and Mark V that was in service at the time. Absolutely. Uh, lethal aeroplane, lethal. So uh, it's a very changed situation, but this is absolutely relentless. And we go on to the 21st of November, 1941, and Tommy moves again. And he's off to Eglinton in Northern Ireland and takes command of 133 Eagle Squadron, which was one of the American squadrons. Again, flying Spitfires, and they're up in Northern Ireland, uh, but, all, but pretty, pretty swiftly, 
go to Curtin and Lindsay in 12 group. And it's at that time that he is awarded a well-earned Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, and this is the citation. It says, this officer has been actively engaged in operational flying since August 1940. He fought in the Battle of Britain and has participated in 60 sorties over enemy territory since the beginning of 1941. He has destroyed at least three enemy aircraft and shared in the destruction of another. He has also damaged a patrol ship. Assuming command of the squadron, 611, in June 1941, Squadron Leader Thomas has consistently displayed great skill and leadership and has contributed materially to its high morale. So he's a respected and popular leader, no question about it. So 31st of January 1942, uh, Eric marries uh, Kate Irene Smith in Tunbridge and then he's straight back into action. I mean, talk about an uncertain future for a married couple straight back into action uh, and by this time April 1942 we've got the start of what was called the Baydecker raids where uh, heritage sites were targeted using a guidebook written by a chap called Baydecker and uh, the baby blitz it was called uh, and the Spitfires are, are being used to patrol at night again which they've done during the main night blitz uh, and Eric Thomas is, is involved in this uh, then, May 1942, 133 Squadron's rest period, or working up period, at Curtin comes to an end, and off they go to join the Biggin Hill Wing, which is joined, uh, commanded at the time by Wing Commander Jamie Rankin, another ace fighter pilot. Uh, and this is, this is again absolutely relentless, the, the, the quantity and frequency and pressure of these operations over France. And there's more combat Eric's involved with, with Pop Wolf on 90s, uh, until 31st of July 1942. And this indicates the level of experience and respect for this man. He then succeeds Jamie Rankin as Biggin Hill Wing Leader and has his initials EHT painted on the side of his Spitfire 9. So he's Wing Leader. Why, why, why don't we know more about him? He's a Wing Leader. So he's in charge of three Spitfire squadrons, and, and interestingly, at Biggin Hill at the time, uh, there were French Spitfire squadrons, three French, uh, which he was involved with, and, and uh, was ultimately awarded the uh, Croix de Guerre avec Paul uh, by de Gaulle himself. And what they're doing now is um, really escorting the American flying fortresses. Now, I'm going to have a moan here, because we've got Masters of the Air screening currently, uh, and it's a mixed bag, I'm afraid, for me. Uh, the one thing I object to is there's no... The, the only mention of the Royal Air Force so far has been derogatory. Um, and the impression is given that those flying fortresses were flying completely unescorted when the Mighty Eight started its uh, daylight strategic bombing campaign. That is patently untrue. Spitfires were used with long-range tanks to escort those fortresses as far as they could. But the Spitfire was, at the end of the day, a short-range interceptor. It was not designed as a long-range offensive fighter. And they could only take them so far. Now, I remember speaking to Air Vice Marshal John Johnson, our officially top-scoring RAF fighter pilot of the Second World War, about this. Uh, and, and Johnny uh, and his Canadian wing, they, they were there... Uh, es part of the escort for the big big week, the Schweinfurt, Regensburg raids, uh, and they, they, they knew that as soon as they had to turn back, that's when the German fighters logically and tactically would pounce, and then they had to get back, uh, operating from bases such as Lim, uh, which is about, uh, near, Lim is nearly in the sea, uh, to get as close to France as possible to extend range, get back, refuel, take off, and then meet the tattered, battered uh, remnants of these bomber formations on the way out. And it was heartbreaking for them. But to suggest that there was no escort is just patently untrue and very disrespectful to the Allied pilots who were actually doing a very, very difficult job with, without the right tools to do it until the American long-range fighters, the P-51, P-47 uh, and the P-38 turn up. That's a different ball game. 
but let's get it right please mr spielberg mr hanks uh, and let's just not try and twist history uh, like this because it's just not on i'm afraid but there we are so uh, eric thomas is involved in the very first uh, flying fortress operation which was uh, 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 well, uh, and uh, so it goes on you see we, we've got that first fortress raid is on the uh, 17th of August 1941 and the Biggin Hill Wing is flying rear support cover so we've got escort there'll be Spitfires up front Spitfires above Spitfires underneath Spitfires either side only can go so far these raids are not going to Germany yet. Lille is well within the Spitfire's range, which is what the target was. You know, the RAF Bomber Command had been escorted by day to Lille uh, uh, for, for you know, <laughs> well over a year because of the, non the non-stop offensive. So, you know, please, please, please let us get it right. Uh, then, two days later, it's Operation Jubilee, which is the massive air battle over Dieppe when the Canadian troops were landed from the sea uh, at Dieppe and massacred, essentially. The whole thing was a dismal failure uh, at a great cost in Canadian life particularly. And the day saw the heaviest daylight fighting, air fighting, since the Battle of Britain. Um, and on that day, uh, Eric was involved again and um, it, it's massive. The Big and Hill Wing claims 15 enemy aircraft destroyed, uh, Eric damages a 190, uh, but they lost six pilots, uh, and it, it was all a bit of a disaster. Why it happened, I don't think we'll ever really know. Was it to prove to Stalin that he was clamouring for the Allies to start the Second Front, that uh, the Allies were not ready to do that yet? So were the connect was it set up to be a failure? Or, or was it just testing the water and it just didn't work? I, I'm not sure we'll ever know really exactly what happened. Uh, but either way, it was unsuccessful. So, uh, 18th of September 1942, and Tommy's awarded a bar to his distinguished flying cross. And he's still flying. By that time, in his logbook, he's got 750 hours and 10 minutes uh, on Spitfires by day. 427 hours and 45 minutes of that is operational and 26.45 hours by night and a total of 368 ops operational flight that's a pretty big record uh, 9th of october 1942 sees the biggest daylight bomber raid so far when the 8th air force sends 108 b-17s and b-24s uh, to lil Again, now, and, and this is these are the facts. They're escorted now by 36 Spitfire squadrons and two squadrons of P-38 Lightning. So I'll say that again. 36 Spitfire squadrons are escorting those flying fortresses. You won't see one Spitfire in Masters of the Air. Anybody think we weren't there? Anyway, don't get me going on that. So, um... They're constantly, constantly escorting the Americans. Uh, and let's just have another read from uh, Tommy's logbook, which is a fascinating document. Um, and he said, so, so this is that, this is this big raid now, the big raid on the 9th of October 1942. I was leading the wing with 610 Squadron as rear support for fortresses bombing Lil. The wing arrived over Gravelina on time at 25,000 feet, just below a thin layer of cirrus. Five bombers came out and I then saw two aircraft coming north over Gravelino. I got in a full quarter attack on the leader, which turned out to be a Focke-Wulf 190, and gave a second burst full deflection from 200 yards, and a quick squirt at the other 190, which I'm sure I missed. The first one went vertically down, followed by his number two, and I last saw him at about 15,000 feet. Still going vertically at a phenomenal speed. I had to pull up and around then, uh, but I understand another member of the squadron saw him crash just off Gravelina into the sea. We patrolled for another 10 minutes, watching the bombers come out beneath us. 
and I saw just west of Gravelline four more 190s in line astern uh, flying in much the same formation as a section of Spitfires. I turned in and got on their tails but they then saw me and put their noses down and dived vertically away. I gave the number three a demoralising squirt from about 800 yards and was much surprised to see him immediately emit vo volumes of blue smoke from the engine. He continued on vertically down with a trail of blue smoke about 5,000 feet long coming from him. Squadron leader Johnson, that's Johnny Johnson, who was commanding 610, uh, and my number three also witnessed it. I claim one Fock Wolf 190 destroyed, one Fock Wolf 190 damaged, and four Fock Wolf 190s frightened. Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. Frightened. I bet they were. So, where are we now? Okay. Yeah, right, good. Yep. Yeah. Relentless. But, January 1943, he's rested at last. This is a long tour that, that he's been on, all this operational flying, and goes to 10 Group headquarters. Incredibly, three weeks later, somehow, Tommy manages to get command of the Ibsley Spitfire Wing in Hampshire. So he's back in the air again, after just three weeks. Unbelievable. Um... You know, I, I think I think you know you could say it's a bit of a bit of a king type. So back in the air, commanding the Ibsley Wing, and it's the same. More of these escort sorties, particularly over the Cherbourg area, uh, because of the geographic location of Ibsley. Uh, there's lots going on, uh, and then 20th of January 1943, uh, he's awarded the dis or, or invested in the Distinguished Service Order, which is the right language to you. Very um, prestigious, the Distinguished Service Order, which is for leadership. And he's now got what's called the double, which is what every fighter pilot wants. Uh, well, they, they want two things. They want the double, which is the DSO and DFC, plus he's got a bar to his DFC, so that's the medal awarded twice. Uh, and uh, he's, he, he's a wing leader. And Johnny Johnson always said that the wing leader was the best job in the Air Force because it was just about flying operationally and leading the wing in the air um, while somebody else got on with all, all the admin and logistics and, and all that boring stuff. So, fantastic. Wing commander flying. So, uh, more escorts until August 1943, rested again, sent to the uh, Fighter Command School of Tactics. Now... Then we've got another tragedy in the family, because on the night of 3rd, 4th November 1943, uh, Tommy's other brother, Flying Officer Bobby Thomas, who's a Lancaster pilot, is shot down by a German night fighter on a raid at Dusseldorf, uh, and is also killed. So that's two brothers, two brothers lost. Uh, he didn't fly actually on D-Day, but, but manages to borrow a Spitfire and hops over the channel to have a look at what's going on. And uh, it's all quite graphic, really. Um, uh, and in fact, he says, this is the 10th of June, 1944. So four days after D-Day, he uh, flew down to Lynn uh, in a, an airspeed Oxford and borrowed another Spitfire, uh, a Mark 9. And he wrote in his logbook, first patrol in Beachhead area, Flew as Red 3 to squadron leader J JCF Hater, DFC 74 squadron. Fair amount of bloke broken cloud, heavy and light flat from Khan uh, area, masses of ships offshore, and gliders, parachutes of all colours in the field. Ground pockmarked with bomb and shell hole. However, it seems strangely quiet everywhere, somehow uh, compared to what one had expected. But what a sight that must have been. So, Tommy Thomas, at the end of the day, you know, you, you're witnessing history, aren't you? History in the making. Really significant history. And he was there. So, incredible. So, uh, and the following day, in fact, he flew uh, w w one of these, which is, um, w which is the Mark 14 Spitfire, which doesn't look a great deal like the Mark 1. Uh, it's got the, the Griffin engine, and uh, it's a beast of a Spitfire. 
this has got a performance. We need to, you know, by the time we get up to Mark 24, uh, and I think even the, the Mark 14 shot down uh, only 262 jets. This is a beast of an aircraft. It really is. Uh, and he he's flying one of those. Uh, and the big threat at the time is the uh, V1 flying bombs, Hitler's vengeance weapons. Uh, and they're coming over by the hundreds, if not thousands. And these things, they've got a jet engine, and uh, you're fine if you can hear them. When the engine cuts out, that's when they drop. Uh, and, I mean, it, this is not precision bombing. I mean, this is pretty random, isn't it? The, the fuel is calculated to run out roughly at where you want the bomb to hit. So, essentially, it's the cities, isn't it? Southampton, London, particularly, as always, uh, and so on. So, these Spitfires and Hawker Tempests, they're, they're, uh, particularly they're, them Typhoons, they're patrolling the south coast, trying to catch these things on the way in. Which is what, um, which is what Eric Thomas finds himself doing. Uh, v and anti V one patrols, anti diver patrols. That was the code name for the V one, the diver. And twenty um, seventh of June, nineteen forty four, he's leading yellow section of three squadron flying Hawker Tempest, and he destroys a V one uh, over Rye. Uh, that's remarkable. To shoot down a bomb in the air, boom! What a thing. And um, to, just amazing. So, so his experience goes from flying the Gloucester Gauntlet biplane right through uh, the Battle of Britain, the non stop offensive, the uh, escort sorties in the strategic bombing campaign, uh, you know, Dieppe, fighting the Fokker 190, then the Spit 9, which, which, as Johnny Johnson always said, once we got the Spit 9 with the two stage supercharger, the air belonged to us, uh, you know return the balance of power to the Royal Air Force and uh, and so on. And, you know, massive experience. You commanded section, flight, squadrons and a wing. Uh, amazing. So the problem, though, is that is his last combat success because he's actually not a well man. He's got tuberculosis. And on the 22nd of September 1944, wing commander Eric Thomas, DSO, DFC and Bar, Croy de Guerre avec Paul, with a combat record of four enemy aircraft destroyed, one shared destroyed, uh, a probable and another probable shared, and four damaged and a damaged shared, it's an impressive combat score, uh, is, is medically retired from the service. Prematurely. It makes you wonder if he'd have, you know, if he'd remained in the Air Force with a permanent commission in the post-war air, air force, how far up the ladder he would have gone, because he's obviously a very, very competent officer uh, and a popular leader. So, um, but what a shame! Uh, and it makes you wonder. Those oxygen systems in those aircraft were pretty primitive, and there were quite a few pilots suffering from this. And it makes you wonder whether maybe unhygienic oxygen systems weren't partially responsible or, or a partial cause. I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but uh, it would certainly be interesting to know. Uh, after leaving the Air Force, there were a few jobs. Mess Secretary to HQ uh, 11 Group uh, Fighter Command at Uxbridge and uh, later managing the car parks at Royal Ascot, Ascot the big race course. And um, uh, it ha unfortunately, uh, Irene and, and Eric's first son, Guy, uh, died of a rare bone cancer, but uh, but after the war, fortunately, Tim and Sylvia came along, so uh, he's a, a father, uh, and then tragically uh, dies aged 41 on the 21st of April 1959 of the tuberculosis. Oh, what, what a sad end and premature end to, to somebody with such a distinguished fire record. Uh, and, and I think that's, again, you know, ma makes the story really sad. And he's definitely one of these people whose flying career spans virtually, you know, the whole period of interest from the Battle of Britain, the, the non-stop offensive, the bomber escort missions, um, and the, the V1 rockets, you know, I, I mean, amazing. So he's a forgotten hero. Uh, the story, it's not a plug for the book, I mean, you know, I'm not really bothered. But 
you write a book because you want somebody to read it. And the reason you do that is because you want to share these stories. Uh, and the, the Thomas story is written in, in you know, well, they're all very detailed, uh, but it's, it's all in there. So um, hopefully that's done something to put him on the map. And uh, I'm very pleased to have had the support of uh, Sylvia and Tim, Eric Thomas's uh, son and daughter, uh, join the course of my research and um, they'll be watching this and I hope you enjoy it and I hope that uh, that's helped put uh, Wing Commander Thomas on the radar. So thanks for thanks for watching. If, uh, if you enjoy what we do, we've got lots of stuff coming, more videos, regular content being posted now, podcasts, really getting into some detailed stuff actually, doing a, a, quite a lot of first-hand account stuff with the podcast at the moment. Uh, which people seem to like uh, and if you like what we do subscribe to the channel and uh, hopefully we'll see you've enjoyed this and uh, we'll see you next time any feedback by all means leave it in the comments uh, section below and uh, I look forward to talking to you again thank you